Gannon Stout was only 11 years old when he was allegedly murdered by his stepmother, Letitia Stout. She's locked up at the El Paso County Jail in Colorado, awaiting trial for his murder. Her journey to prison has been full of bizarre twists and turns that would make a reasonable person assume Letitia is mentally unbalanced. But according to the state hospital, she's as sane as you or me, which just means she's competent to stand trial. In today's recap, you're going to get caught up on this case from the beginning to today. You're going to hear about Letitia's shocking jailhouse interview, the letter she wrote to the judge, and learn key information about Gannon's brutal murder straight from the leaked arrest affidavit. And remember, if Letitia did all the things you're about to hear and she's officially not criminally insane, what are we left with? I guess she's just pure evil. I'm Chris with True Crime Recaps. From the very beginning, Letitia's behavior was bizarre. She lashed out on social media, insisting Gannon was still alive, and everyone was being mean to suggest she had anything to do with his disappearance. She blamed Gannon's biological mother, Landon, for bad parenting, and less than a week after Gannon disappeared, she did this bizarre interview with a local Colorado Springs news station, but refused to face the camera or take off her sunglasses. You are? I am Tisha Stout, which is Gannon's stepmother. You know, I, I'm just ready for Gannon to come home. Most importantly, for him to see his family. But second, I am going to be so ecstatic when I'm able to say to people that I hope they have a really sincere apology for all these theories that have came out online, for all the things they said that I have done or people have done. And I just want everyone to know that we're going to find Gannon. And I love him so much. I've helped taking care of him for so long. Can you talk to me a little bit about him? I don't know him. Gannon is so kind and he loves to play video games. That's one of his favorite things. He loves Sonic and Mario and, you know, he's always helpful and I, he was always so helpful with the dogs around the house and we have two little cute dogs and he was always like a person I could say, Gannon, can you go do this? And he would do it right away. You know, sometimes with kids we have to remind them and things like that and that's okay, but he was so sweet and able to help anyone. He could notice when you're sick and say, are you okay? And such a kind heart. I took care of Gannon for the last two years in our home because his mother didn't want to do it. Gannon, when you get here, you'll be able to truly tell what happened. And then I really hope I get a sincere apology from everyone who has made all those things, especially from my husband. We just wanted to add a message to Gannon from my family, is that we love you and miss you. And we hope that you come home soon. And Gannon, I can't wait till you can come home and let everyone know that you're okay. We love you. According to the leaked affidavit, on Sunday, January 26th, Letitia told police that Gannon knocked over a candle and burned the carpet. In a police interview on January 29th, she told them she'd hired a man to come fix it the next day. After Gannon went missing, she posted this strange and disturbing video to her Facebook. Gannon, I promise this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I'm just freaked out, okay? Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? He did it. Okay, you promise. He promise. On purpose. Pinky promise. Pinky. Okay, all right, so listen. Listen. We're, all right, I'm, we're going to have to sell stuff to fix it, okay? So okay. we figure out what we got to sell. We can sell the sofa, we can sell whatever, because we got to get it fixed, so uh -huh. lady. Don't be mad at us and kick us out of the house. Okay? <clears throat> you got it? Maybe she was attempting to back up the story she had told police about the carpet repairman as an alternative suspect and explain why Gannon's blood was found in the house. You're going to hear even more bizarre details a little later, but for now, here's what you need to know about what happened to Gannon the next day on January 27th. Gannon and Letitia were home alone together on Monday. His eight-year-old sister was at school. Tisha's teenage daughter was at work. His dad, Al, was in Oklahoma with the National Guard. And his biological mom, Landon, was living in South Carolina. Only Letitia and Gannon know what exactly happened that morning, but here's what we do know based on her arrest affidavit. That morning, Letitia texted Al that Gannon was up all night sick to his stomach and that she was going to make an excuse at work and stay home with him. Here's another glimpse into Tisha's mindset. She texted her boss that she couldn't come to work because her stepdad had been hit by a car and killed. 
Around 10.15 a.m., the neighbor's surveillance video shows Letitia and what looks like Gannon leaving the house in Al's truck. But Letitia locked her cell phone and left it behind. The affidavit pointed out that because Letitia used her phone nonstop and posted to Facebook and Instagram a lot, it was very unusual for her phone to be locked and unused. The Stouk's home security system registered no movement in the house from 10.15 until 2.22, and her cell phone wasn't unlocked until 2.45. When they got home, the security system showed movement upstairs and a lot of movement in the basement. That's where Gannon's room was. Police believe that's where he was killed based on the amount of evidence they found there. They discovered blood soaked through his mattress, the rug, the carpet pad, and stained the concrete under his bed. They found blood on his bedroom walls and a few other places in the house. And based on the autopsy results, a gun, a knife, and a blunt instrument were used to kill him. By the time Letitia's eight-year-old stepdaughter came home from school at 3.15, Gannon was already dead. Letitia told her to go outside and play because Gannon was in bed resting. Less than two hours later, Letitia texted her teenage daughter to go to the dollar store and pick up carpet cleaner, vinegar, trash bags, and baking soda. Your basic murder scene cleanup supplies. And at 7 o'clock that night, Letitia called 911 to report Gannon missing. She told police he went to a friend's house around 3 o'clock and never came home. To quote the affidavit, her story dramatically changed multiple times over the following days. The next morning, Gannon's dad, Al, came back to town. When Letitia drove to the airport to pick him up, police believe Gannon's body was in the trunk of her car. She parked at the short-term parking lot and rented a car to pick up Al and drive him home. You're probably wondering what her explanation was. Did she tell her husband her car was broken, stolen? No, she told him her car wasn't in the garage because she'd parked it nearby at an elementary school. And she rented a car to pick him up because she thought they should go looking for Gannon in a car he wouldn't recognize so he wouldn't think he was in any, any trouble and run away. At 7 o'clock that same night, she drove back to the airport to pick up her car. She turned off her phone again and drove Gannon's body to a remote area near Palmer Lake, Colorado. Using tracking information from her car, police found a particle board with Gannon's DNA on it in that area on February 15th. She returned the rental car the next morning. And here's a very strange thing about that rental car. Police got a hold of it before it was rented to anyone else and they found blood in the trunk. It was from a male, but it wasn't a match to Gannon, so that rental car has seen some things. Police suspected Letitia from the very beginning. On March 2nd, she was arrested in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for first degree murder and other charges. But it wasn't until March 17th when a road crew near Pace, Florida found a suitcase thrown off the side of Highway 90. What was left of Gannon's body was inside. His body traveled more than 1,000 miles before she dumped him on her way to Myrtle Beach. Think like that, to do something so heinous. So open, we'd hear the kids playing outside. That's the best sound is the kids outside playing. And he was one of them. Colorado to Florida with their body and not be noticed. We'll be served. If it's not here on earth, it'll be up in heaven. Letitia has a long history of lying and blaming anyone and everyone for Gannon's murder. On September 3rd, she told Crime Online that she's been covering for the real killers, hoping that the full truth that's not sugar-coated would come out. She said Al owed someone named Edgar money, and then Edgar took Gannon. But then in the same conversation, she contradicts herself and points the finger at Al instead. Here's what she told Crime Online. Al should be here for manslaughter because it was on January 28th. That's why the police didn't have anything. Albert came in on the 28th from the airport and was like in a moment of rage. I mean, I could be on the low end and I could say, you know, he should be here for murder, but I'm not. I'm saying that it should be, I guess, manslaughter would be the thing. And then she keeps running with this new story saying, Albert made a stupid decision, you know? It just wasn't, you know, a good situation. So, you know, he told me a story to tell the police. You know, and I just don't know what to say. She said she was scared of Al because he told her that he would pull some strings if she didn't snitch. That interview wasn't the first time she spoke to Crime Online. In May, she complained that she might have PTSD because of her case, saying, you have plenty of time to sit in here and actually like breathe and be able to process it because I hadn't even went through the emotions of it all yet, you know? And at the end of February, before she was arrested, she tried scheduling an interview with Nancy Grace to prove her innocence. She said she passed an independent polygraph test, but when police looked into it, they learned she 
bought that independent polygraph test from a site called fakepolygraph.com. And you're going to love this. The people at fakepolygraph.com took one look at the questions she created and refused to send her the results. So she asked them why, and take a look at the conversation she had with the customer service rep. Her, what do you do now? Just delete it and go on about life and keep the money? Him, yes, we do indeed. Her, okay, gotcha, thank you, goodbye. And then they gave her polygraph to the police. Two days after she reported Gannon missing, the police asked her to come in and answer some questions. To start things off, she was two hours late. She also brought notes with her and kept checking them during the interview. She probably needed cue cards because her story took another major turn. On that day, she told detectives she was raped at gunpoint by a man named Eduardo. She said she hired him to come over and fix a carpet that Gannon had burned when he knocked over the candle. But after raping her, he hit her on the head and kidnapped Gannon while she was passed out. So they asked if she wanted to be examined for a rape kit. She said no. Then police told her they had a warrant for her DNA, so she faked a panic attack and was taken to the hospital. To quote the leaked affidavit again, Letitia had a miraculous recovery and managed to leave the hospital without giving up her DNA. Over the next few weeks, she changed her story a few more times. She told her husband she was raped by a different man. The man laid down in front of her car, and then when she stopped, he jumped in and attacked her and Gannon coincidentally in the same area near Palmer Lake where his DNA was found, she repeatedly reached out to police asking if she was a suspect and then offering explanations for why Gannon's blood might be found in the house. She told them he'd cut himself while working on projects with Al in the garage. She told them he'd hurt himself with the candle that burnt the carpet and then wiped his bloody hands on the walls. Police weren't buying anything she said and they're building their case against her now. Part of the evidence came from her search history starting even before January 27th. Here are a few of the most interesting searches she did before Gannon was murdered. She googled, I'm overdoing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help. And one day people will wish they treated you differently. Then she looked up things like, I wonder if my husband's ex-wife is sending me a Valentine's Day card since I raise her kids. It's crappy some parents don't care for their kids or buy them presents. Parenting should be four people, not one. Find real military singles and find me a rich guy who wants me to take care of his kids. She'd been married to Al since 2015. The day he disappeared, Gannon's phone was used to search, can my parent find my phone if it's off? Notice the period between find my phone and if it's off? Police realized that's the same way Letitia Frey's search terms found on her phone. And by the way, the answer to can my parent find my phone if it's off is it depends which might be why Gannon's phone was later found at the house. Letitia has tried escaping justice a few times in a few different ways. When she was being returned to Colorado to stand trial, she slipped out of her handcuffs near Kansas City and attacked one of the deputies guarding her. She didn't get too far. Her master plan at the El Paso County Jail involved using a broom handle and the help of a fellow inmate to bust out through her cell window. As you can probably guess, the inmate told the guards and Letitia earned herself another charge in early June. On August 12th, she wrote Judge Gregory Werner a four-page letter complaining that her constitutional rights are being violated. She hasn't been allowed to speak with her lawyers often enough and her phone calls are being recorded. She also claimed that her treatment is cruel and unusual and a violation of her Eighth Amendment rights. She says she's getting threats in her peanut butter because, as she says, I provided evidence of not only my innocence, but evidence that will show it was who it was through my PI. And then the letter gets really strange. Listen to this. This is not okay in a country in which our country prides itself on democracy. A country with a flag that got a hole in it at Flanders Field in WW1. One that turned blood red in WW2. Or the one that got a cut with a sword at Chancellorsville. Through all this, the flag has stood up. We raise her up every morning because this country still stands for freedom, perseverance, justice, and vigilance. Then she brings it all together with this statement. I am showing the same things that flag shows, valor, courage, purity, and innocence to write to you to say I do not feel like a U.S. citizen being treated this way in my beloved country. She also made sure to let the judge know that she has a doctorate degree in education, which is a lie she's been telling for months. 
In fact, just days before Gannon's murder, she lost a teaching job in Colorado Springs because they found out she'd lied on her application. Letitia is charged with 13 counts in this case, including first-degree murder, child abuse resulting in death, and tampering with evidence. But despite her many attempts to outsmart, outlie, or outrun justice, her day in court is getting closer. Her next hearing is scheduled for November 12th, so the judge can review a second mental health evaluation her attorneys requested. Meanwhile, the prosecution is building its case against her with hundreds of thousands of pages of discovery, including more than 100 search warrants, a 32-page affidavit, transcripts from multiple bizarre interviews, and changes to her story, proof that she's constructed dozens of lies about her past, those red flag Google searches, and that purchase of a fake lie detector test that was so alarming that the company turned it over to the police. And at the end of it all, Letitia might find out the hard way that she wasn't so smart after all. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe and hit the bell so you know when it's time to weigh in on a new case. We're here every Wednesday and Sunday, so please be sure to come back and hang out with Amy on Wednesday, all right? Take care.